Hey everybody, welcome back to Chicago Reacts, your favorite channel on the YouTubes. I'm Zach, an actor here in the city of Chicago, soon to be worldwide, and as always on my left and your right. I'm Michael, everybody. I'm also an actor here in the city of Chicago. We're back with Chicago Reacts. Today we are checking out Caves of Cood Review. Cube. Cood. Quid, quid. Seth Zintak, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, hey, if you're liking these videos, hit that like button, subscribe to the channel so you don't miss anything else. Leave a comment in that comment section down below. And check out those links in the description so you can see what we're up to. With that said, let's jump All into right. it. Caves of Cude. Mm -hmm. Hey, Seth here. Hey, Seth. Hey. Hey. Too deep and found something they don't want you to know. Oh. Sandy Loam, who is she and why can't I oh. reach her? Have you ever fallen out with someone and... Dude, if Seth is starting out a video with that question, you <laughs> know this is gonna be effing Yo, wild, this is dude. Gonna be crazy. If Seth Zintok starts a video with that question, oh my god, it's gonna be nuts. Oh. It's gonna be nuts. Great. <laughs> Restored your friendship using quantum okay. entanglement to okay. retroactively rewrite history and save them from a car crash that never actually happened. Have you ever wanted to skip a lifetime of formal education just by cooking a banana? And finally, have you ever had a fungal infection on your arm cooking that, despite your best efforts, won't go away? No problem. Just Cut it off. Then stab a syringe filled with anabolic growth hormones right into your chest and grow a new one. As you well know, <laughs> mushrooms are a great source of protein. I just hope you're not picky about the origin of that protein. Everything said could be described as the raving of a paranoid schizophrenic, but it isn't. It's an everyday occurrence in the Caves of Quud, which Quid. I'm not sure Quid. to say, so we'll just use the acronym instead. Cock is like the negligent supervisor to a kindergarten daycare. When the yeah. kids ask him if they can collectively mutilate themselves in the sandbox, he doesn't say, no, don't do that. He says, give it a try. See what <laughs> happens. Caves of Quid is an open-ended sandbox roguelike which is still in development. Despite this, it's entirely playable and extremely fun. Fun, which I define as I spent half a day with my screen looking like this, and I had to kill a man for his tattoo gun so I could drink the ink, pull the cord on a flashbang, and explode it into my open eyes. Why? Because in this game, that's how you cure monochromia. If pain and suffering are the extra edge to your enjoyment, you're gonna have a great time. If you're asking yourself right now, Seth, what the fuck am I looking at? <laughs> it might not be your cup of tea, but I don't drink tea because they tampered my water supply, and ever since I started drinking from a public tap, I've been getting more and more of these androgynous body pillows. Let's be real here. Caves of Quud, Caves of Could, Cock, is not the <laughs> of games. This is probably the only game you could get caught playing in the office and have your boss look at the screen and think, damn, my man's Excel spreadsheet looks fucked up. It's not a very <laughs> visual game, even though there are some nice visuals here and there. You're gonna have to use imagination. And if you can't, take my word for it that this random collection of pixels is actually a small farming community. So, what's the story of Quud? I don't know. There <laughs> used to be an advanced transhumanist civilization living on Quud, but they're not around anymore. Instead, we got mutated everything from humans to trees, from pigs to chimpanzees. Every Everything thinks, feels, and the plants talk behind your back. Welcome uh. to Quud. It's a complete madhouse, but hey, it's very colorful. To play this stupid game, you need to make a character, for which you've got two options, mutant or truekin. What's the what difference? The? Mutants are genetic freaks, and they randomly mutate their genome as they level up, which includes, but not limited to, multiple heads, multiple feet, multiple hands, two hearts, paralyzing stingers, regrowing limbs, the ability to fly, the ability to induce a brain aneurysm, <laughs> spontaneous combustion, <laughs> teleportation, phasing through solid objects, and even yes. infinite nutrition from the sun, because oh. your skin is made of chlorophyll. So, what's the downside? Oh. You're a horrific abomination. And if you encounter a certain holy inquisition of turbo-augmented race purists, they'll kill you on sight. Conversely, true to the name, Truekin are humans that haven't mutated. They don't get mutations. They get <laughs> cybernetic <laughs> augmentations. Ooh. These don't come 
become cheap. You first need to obtain an implant, whether by chance or by cutting the electronics out of a dead Templar. Then you need to find an <laughs> autonomous upgrade terminal, which, upon detecting that you are indeed a pure-blooded human, refers to you as aristocrat and allows you to install as many implants as you want, provided your body has space and provided you did not forget to upgrade your cybernetic software license. Because even if a world is over, we cannot forget the importance of arbitrary bureaucratic administration. <laughs> and by God, you're going to follow strict HR protocol to get your transhumanist upgrades. Every registered cybernetic yes. in your body runs a license cost. The total cannot exceed the license, which you have to upgrade using cybernetic credits. These are exceptionally rare, and there's no easy way of finding them. And rightly so, because cybernetics are absolutely ridiculous. Tired of your tiny, feminine hands? Giant hands. A giant <laughs> AI controlled injectors designed to pump you full of life saving chemicals depending on the situation instantaneously. Do you want to fabricate narcotics in the middle of combat? We can install fingers on top of your fingers. Yes. And if you ever change your mind, you can swap them out for something else. However, amputating your legs to replace them with a set of motorized tank treads <laughs> is, unfortunately, an irreversible process. Personally, I recommend you play a mutant when starting. Starting out, there's not really any bad choices in character creation, but realistically, don't get too attached to your first dozen. Once you're more confident, you can play Trukin instead, and abuse the system so hard, you'll forget the original purpose of this game. Attributes are simple, combat is even simpler, which is convenient because fighting is the main way to level up. You're gonna be doing a lot of fighting, and death is an ever-present reality, especially at lower levels. If I'm going to be very honest with you, most of you will reach Red Rock for one of the early quests, and get stoned to death by a pack of bloodthirsty baboons. <laughs> My advice, get a gun. There's a lot of dangers out there, but bullets don't discriminate. They only penetrate. This game is all about risk management, and there's no telling what you're going to encounter, because nearly everything is randomly generated and unique to your save file. The Holy settlements, the cultures, the damn. lore, the layouts of dungeons and dwellings across the world, and even the pharmacological treatment for different types of disease Okay, so I've done, I've played games before with like random generation, right? Yeah. But random generation on to this extent is this? insane. I mean, how like this game literally f's you in the mind? Like how? This is such a sessine talk. This game. is such a <laughs> sessine talk game. It's it's so. n it's not it's not even funny. I mean. Like I'm watch I'm literally looking at the screen trying to figure out what is happening on any level. But then th th this like <laughs> you you could you could introduce somebody to this game and and everybody that plays it is gonna have a completely different playthrough of it. Mm -hmm. Whether they die in the first 10 seconds or the first five hours or the first five hundred hours. Anybody that plays this is going to just have a completely different blueprint of what the game is. Yeah. And and all by nature of of the the random randomness. I mean, somebody coming up with the idea for this game in and of itself is crazy. But then yeah. all of the the computing and the coding that goes into randomizing everything. I mean, <laughs> that is nuts. That is nuts. You know, like procedurally generated like Caves or something like yeah. that in an RPG game. Like, I'm sure you've experienced Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. But procedurally generated or randomly generated treatment cures mm -hmm. for, for sicknesses that are also randomly generated. Yeah. And on top of all this stuff that's already, like, what? <laughs> Dude, what? I mean, essentially, it's like, um, even, it's like the designer created a game that they could play and not know how to do it. <laughs> Like, no, I'm I'm creating a fun game, but I I don't want to know the answer. To play. That's, and that's I think a, that is that's a that's great. pretty cool. You know, <laughs> I created a game that I could play forever and it's, not be done. The yeah, the the creator of the game basically made the game of all games. The creators and everything that are truly know yeah. how to play upon start. Like that's great. <laughs> that's, that's such a great that's excellent <laughs> that's <such laughs> and it great. fits so like there's part of me that's <laughs> like we've watched Seth so much that like I'm like this game is this, insane but yeah. also this game is this as game. insane as most okay. of the other yeah. Seth yeah. games that we watched yeah. 
But this is cool. I think this is the first time where we've seen random generation to this point. And I think Seth does a really good job of of specifying this like right away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um yeah, no idea where this is gonna go. We'll see, but I mean it's it's a long video, so yeah. It's good. Let's check it out. Are built completely mm. out of RNG. Amazingly, it actually works most of the time. The only things that stay the same are the location of unique settlements, the topography of the map, and of course, the main quest line. Caves of Quid is quite unique in this regard, since most roguelikes don't have an overarching story. It's currently unfinished, so consider it entirely optional. If you're looking to follow an objective, and possibly, probably, most likely, die in a process. If it makes you feel any better, most players get to Golgotha and then they quit. In my case, I got to Golgotha, came back, and then I realized that wasn't the hard part. What did he mean by this? I'm not gonna tell you. You're gonna have to experience that for yourself. I'm not joking when I say this game has one of the steepest difficulty curves, and one fatal mistake uh. could end your entire playthrough. Or, you know, just hit Alt F4 and uh, never tell anyone. Let me tell you yeah, about seriously. mechanics. Firstly, overlay UI. Turn it on. I have no idea why it's not the default, but it's virtually unplayable without it. There's a lot of interesting monster designs in this game. Interesting in their design to creatively reduce your life expectancy. <laughs> Most common cause of death, a brick wall, because for some reason, mimics are level 25 and still generate where they shouldn't. That's good programming. Just like choosing Unity to be the basis of your sandbox roguelike. How about Rusty Sawblade that dismembers on every hit? I hope you have an extra head, because otherwise, it's game over. Your right face is a homemade facial accessory is both fashionable and attractive. Do you like bananas? How about being peeled like a banana? Because for about <laughs> half the banana trees in this game, the fruit comes to them. This may surprise newer players as pressing auto explore in the banana grove is a guaranteed single click shortcut to being disemboweled. Have you ever wondered about the struggle of living with dyslexia? If so, encounter a psychic master and his slaves and you won't have to wonder anymore. And why not say fuck it, let's add a giant magnet to the game. Because stripping you of your dignity is no longer enough. We're going to forcibly strip you of your items as well. And considering most people have auto pickup turned on by default. Watch as your character is forced into an infinite dance of losing items, picking them up, only to lose them again until you starve to death or smash escape fast enough to Holy turn it off. You know, the sweet. great pyramids oh, of no. Egypt? Imagine they could fly. Now, imagine <laughs> you fused it with a Sherman T-34 Calliope and expanded the rocket tubes to a hundred. Not too bad when you consider a rocket salvo is only ten, unless they get you up against a wall, in which case you get slammed repeatedly until they empty the entire rack, and then they fabricate and replace each and every high explosive missile in a single turn. At this point, oh why my. not give it an automatic force field, and the ability to randomly teleport across the map? Everything described as an enemy inside Caves of Quood. Is it a unique, optional boss fight? No, it is a common occurrence in the Deathlands, known only as a Chrome Pyramid. And if you see your screen vibrating and glitching, it's a good time to leave. If that sounds overwhelming, let me assure you that's not the case. Because oh every my. in this game, from birds to trees, plants to ants, baboons to raccoons, everything belongs to a specific faction, and their relation to you is dependent on your reputation with a group. <laughs> if you're hated, even the peaceful ones will try to rip you apart. If you're loved, I've... even the most... I feel like the developer of this game was like, you know how they say in Australia, everything is trying to kill you? What if we maxed that to like a hundred and then made it all randomly generated? <laughs> Everything wants to kill you. Everything. 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 Even the things you don't think, they want to kill you. God. And it's they rough. managed to build a, uh, what type of system is that? Um, where it's like you have factions be friendly or, um, Faithful towards you. What type of system is that called? The the short term of it. Uh, anyway, the fact that they've also managed to in, introduce that element. Yeah. Into like alignment. Yeah, okay. align. Yeah, yeah. How things align. Yeah, yeah, basically, yeah. But the fact that they have added that to a game that's already so expansive. Yeah. I mean, instantly added a whole nother. Like, geez. Oh my god. Yeah, it's wild. Oh my god. Yeah.
Sad. <laughs> oh gosh. Members will protect you as one of their own. This applies to others as well. Chimps eat the fuck out of monkeys. And the relation between factions controls their behavior. Let's say you wear a beaded bracelet. This tricks baboons into thinking you're one of their own. That doesn't mean they're not aggressive. That just means they're not aggressive to you. They hunt. They hunt monkeys. They corral them in. It's the most ruthless shit. Because there's a video of this chimp eating a monkey while it's alive. No. It's holding on to the monkey and biting its hips and just pulling chunks of meat while the monkey's screaming like Aah! so how do you influence reputation reputation isn't affected by helping or killing normal people only celebrities much like real life if you kill a lot of short people they won't rise up against you but if you kill a famous minecraft youtuber the size of a small child <laughs> Man, to notice. every faction randomly generates legendary characters and interacting bonding or straight up murdering them will influence your reputation what? depending on that character's personal history for example this is who a legendary baboon queen. She is naturally loved by her people. However, she accidentally dug up some robot's dead grandfather, probably a TI-84 calculator. She also <laughs> sold confidential banking details from one village and stole some shit from another. Quite understandably, these factions don't like her, and smacking her dead with a heavy branch would probably make a lot of people, excluding those that use shit as a projectile, incredibly happy. Now, the most mm. precious resource in Quod is water. There's not much of it around, so the act of sharing your water is one of the most culturally significant actions you can take. Your first is mine, my water is yours. Performing a water ritual will bond you together and strengthen relations. The factions that like them will like you even more, but the factions that don't will dislike you by association. Look at that, However, 50 to minus 5. with another, only later to betray your brother, is the worst crime you can possibly commit. And even the enemy of thy enemy will regard you, the Kinslayer, with open hatred. As will every Holy faction in the game. Of course, shit. you can always use a Schrodinger's page. Remember, it's not considered historical revision when you're doing it with quantum entanglement. As briefly <laughs> mentioned, water is the most valuable commodity. That's why we don't have currency. Water is currency. We don't go by greenback or gold. We go by water. And we trade it by the dram. One dram of water is approximately one one eighth of a fluid ounce, or about 3.6 ml. It is the smallest unit of trade, and a water skin can hold up to 64 drams of fluid, eight fluid ounces, or about 230 ml. In Caves of Quid, we drink our currency. In this world, poverty isn't begging on the streets. Poverty is dying of thirst, and so you need water to live or trade, meaning your currency oh is actually damn God. heavy, and there's only so many water skins you can carry around. It's an interesting system, effectively forcing you to trade valuables for other valuables and measure out water to even out the difference. But to even earn your water, you're going to have to go into the great unknown. Explore, plunder, and pillage your way across the world, and hopefully you can come back alive. It's going to be dangerous, but when the alternative is certain death, I think I'll take my options. Survival <laughs> is not easy, but the game offers you a diverse variety of skills to help you stay alive. Each time you level up, you get skill points, which can be freely distributed to suit your character. Finding combinations that work is a matter of experimentation. For example, I once made a mutant with six arms with an axe in each hand. Axes yes. specialize in dismemberment, and dual welding specializes in attacking simultaneously with each arm. Each turn, my abomination took off up to six limbs, including the head. And believe me, everything eventually runs out of limbs. <laughs> On top of that, you'll run into items you don't understand. These can be described as an yes. artifact and require successful Ooh. identification to properly use. For example, mm. if your character is a complete dumbass, he has no concept of a folding chair. Instead, <laughs> you'll see it as a collection of strange tubes. Also, don't do this with stuff you don't own, because in the process of delicately smashing it to pieces, you might unintentionally break it. And the excuse of, sorry, I was just identifying, doesn't work when you're being violently murdered by a pack of villagers. Artifacts <laughs> are amazing and offer you great 
great flexibility, often augmenting or replacing abilities you don't have with their mechanized technological equivalent. These include, but are not limited to, instant teleportation to any XYZ Ooh. coordinate, biodynamic fuel cells powered by blood, handheld nuclear grenades, or even oh. a pair of rocket skates oh. designed for their intended purpose to burn down every forest in the game. Not only can you use them, but with a tinkering skill, you can also craft them. And provided you've got the appropriate blueprints, you can not only craft them, but also modify them to your heart's content. And for the what? longest time, that seemed like the limits of this game, until I went further beyond and discovered cooking. Imagine living in a world where the difference between life and death is decided almost entirely by what you had for breakfast that day, because that's what cooking is to caves of quood. When everything Ooh. is so mutated, even consuming the mutant will give you their properties, and adding more mutants to the dish will increase the possibilities of your ridiculous combination. For Okay, that's actually really cool, because I feel like in a lot of, like, I guess more casual RPGs and stuff like that, more often than not, it's it's like cooking, alchemy, they're kind of very much secondary or even tertiary things that you would do within a game. Mm -hmm. Like Skyrim, perfect example. 90% of players don't even touch the food or the cooking mechanic or the, the even alchemy. Like yeah. most players don't touch that. But to see a game that like so where where you part of getting the most out of the game requires that you actually like use one of the mechanics that very rarely is utilized to its full potential in yeah. other games. That's that's really cool actually. Um like yeah, because I mean think about it. even we as humans, like we learn most about like objects around us by mm -hmm one of the first things we ask is like is it consumable like what yeah. what are the effects on me by consuming said things so it's it makes a lot of sense especially for a game like this so this is actually really really cool i'm interested to see what types of effects can result by like eating certain types of foods or yeah yeah you're right i haven't played other games that really it really helps a lot other than i mean maybe minecraft comes to mind of one that's like it's important to right, craft and right. cook because you have to keep um the, yeah. but yeah i was actually just playing horizon forbidden west and they have like a cooking mechanic which mm -hmm. does give you bonuses and stuff like that but i always found like it less worth the right time. it's not essential to your uh enjoyment or derived enjoyment of the game whereas yeah. this seems to offer a true, genuine way of actually expanding the game beyond what most players actually experience. Yeah, yeah. So, I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's pretty, pretty cool. integral. Yeah. Example, I can engineer a chance to heal to full health on any tick of damage. Then I pour acid on my feet and become immortal. Or I can use a mental mutation to spawn a huge number of plants that explode when you step on them, eat a gecko that gives me complete immunity to fire, and intentionally cause a chain reaction that turns the entire map into lava while leaving myself untouched. Or I could ask a gigantic sewer slug for his favorite soup recipe, drink it, and turn myself permanently into a gigantic what? sewer slug that stores, pressurizes, what? and spits entire rivers of acid. With all that what? knowledge, the only thing left is to go deeper. Many people go into caves, and they don't come back. Usually, they have stupid names like Nutty Putty Cave. A man actually died there. There's a mother out there that had to explain to her kids, yeah, your, your father, unfortunately, passed away in a nutty putty cave. Do you want that to be you? But I digress, because everything I've told you up until now has been the surface of Quud. What does that mean? Oh, it no. means I've played long enough to see the game for what it really is. A series of challenges that appear impossible until you realize every problem has a solution. And once the puzzle pieces click together, you'll reach that epiphany that the entire system is, by design, designed to be subverted. The sandbox wants you to break it. It wants you to achieve your goal in the most creative way possible. Let me tell you about the real 
caves of quood. For a start, we need quid. a lot of money. We don't have time to earn it, so we're going to print it. Welcome to the lava economy, because lava is extremely valuable. One gram equals 16 drams of water. Okay, oh. great. However, we can Holy. only store it safely inside a one dram glass file. A water skin holds 64, but starts burning the moment you put it in. Previously, I could extinguish the fire caused by the lava by pouring water on it and leaving <laughs> the water skin perfectly intact for me to sell. The developers patched this out and reduced the value of lava twice, but that didn't stop me. Instead, I streamlined the process. Normally, fungal colonies produce lava, which is a good source of early money and parasitic infections, but their capacity is limited. We need industrial quantities. You need to find and identify a thermal grenade and a freeze grenade. Any generation works, but a Mark III is preferable. Next, we need bananas. Either six-day stilt or banana grove. Preserve it <laughs> into sun-dried bananas. Cook it. Gain psychometry. Use psychometry to read the early history of every artifact in your inventory without paying for a data disk ever again. Awesome Get bananas? To level one so you can disassemble scrap and craft grenades. Dang. During the Desert Canyon, locate a nice pocket of shale rock. Quick trivia. What's the melting point of shale rock? About a thousand degrees. Chuck thermal grenades in quick succession until it melts. Congratulations. We've just made lava. Fill as many water skins as you can hold and throw them far away. Now, refrigerate them. Congratulations. You have now freeze-dried your lava. Head back to town and buy whatever you want. With the Federal Reserve forever printing lava, we don't have to worry about money anymore. Next, we need to <laughs> metagame harder. Liquids are important to this game. Liquids are vital. Liquids also mix together and get tainted in the process. Would you like it if a woman stepped in your bowl of cereal? Don't answer that. At the 6th day still, there's a merchant of interest. He sells liquids, sometimes exceptionally rare liquids. He's going to be the catalyst to our success. But mm. there's one problem. He's only one man. We need more. Have a look at my game. Now, let's read the names together. Iker Merchant. Clone of an Iker Merchant. Clone of a clone of an Iker Merchant. You get the idea. We're going to buy his cloning solution, pour it on his body, and watch him multiply. And then we're going to buy cloning solution from his clones to multiply them as well. Why? So we can buy more cloning solution to duplicate any merchant we desire. It takes some time. But first, Holy you have to plant your crops fuck. before you can enjoy the harvest. Now, we're going to buy our way to immortality. How? By purchasing every file of neutron flux. And then, you're going to cook some gravity. Neutron flux gives you a permanent plus one to your armor value, with a one in four chance of gravitational collapse. So, <laughs> I don't like those odds. Neither do I. Take a stink salt injector, stab it into your arm, start cooking. If your body collapses under the weight of a neutron star, go back. Because that never really happened. Because precognition <laughs> is a vision of the future, oh not the present. God. And if you don't like that theoretical timeline, you go back to a divergent point in time when you first injected that cocktail. Walk around, live life, and try again. When the deterministic dice roll of RNG will give you the outcome you desire. Yes, oh this game God. has he saves coming built into the mechanics. Reach immortality. Keep eating bananas. The potassium is good for you and good for your newfound ability to craft nearly every item in the game. Next, the one and only reason I play Trukin is to pacify the Templars. Unique Templars carry a very special cocktail. Unfortunately, they're extremely trigger happy and they have a tendency to inject it upon any sign of conflict. As a Trukin, I simply walk up to them and buy it for a pathetic sum of money. What is it? It's an injector filled with Eater Nectar. Injecting it gives you a eater. permanent plus one to a random attribute, but that's not good enough. We're going to preserve it and condense the nectar, and then we're going to use precognition and cook it, which gives us a one in four chance of getting plus one in all of our attributes permanently. Why However, the these are quite fuck? rare, and I can't know if I'll ever find another. So first, I find a high-level merchant, clone them repeatedly, and buy metamorphic polygel. <laughs> this is cloning solution for items. So now, I can theoretically scale my character to an infinite amount of armor, infinite amount of attributes, and once I clone all the bookstores, an infinite amount of Schrodinger's pages that I can oh use to gain an infinite amount of reputation. And still, I get one shot by a fucking rusty saw. Remember that chrome pyramid I talked about? Previously, nobody actually knew how to deal with these, until one insane madman EMP'd the force field, charged the chrome pyramid, and, with a small flick of a blade, disarmed it. Yes, he ripped off the entire swarm rack. That same swarm rack can be picked up and used. However, the average player what? can only hold a weight of about 300. This thing weighs 1,500. So we modify it, reducing its total weight down to zero. But at this point, weight doesn't really matter. With the exact same method, I disarmed every other robot in the Deathlands.
lands and used them to craft spheres of negative weight, allowing us to effectively roleplay as a high-speed missile launcher. But even that was still not enough. I was tired of paying for goods, so I stabbed a merchant with a love injector and robbed him blind. Then I stabbed a legendary bear, so we could improve human race relations by sharing honey and the location of local beehives. I also stabbed the Pope, made him follow me back to town, and watched as he started a race riot because his reputation with the unwashed masses was not very high. Instead, I wanted companions that don't murder everyone, so I sprayed sentience on a block of concrete and convinced the block of animated concrete to follow me into combat. I found out concrete is not only indestructible, it can also hold weaponry in its hands. Unfortunately, my companion died when what? I foolishly tried to slam through concrete using concrete. I broke mm. a concrete wall. I lost a concrete friend. But none of what I said even holds a candle. Steven Seagal. Oh my god. Expert. Here's yes. some examples of what you can do. Surround yourself with a permanent force field. Oh Use instant my. transmission. Turn walls into lava. Turn brains into liquid using your mind from the other side of the map with clairvoyance. Dominate. I well, I haven't seen recent Steven Seagal Steven's videos like that. Holy. That looked so funny. Okay, there's a great channel <clears throat> called Mr. Gigi. Have you heard of him? No. He uh, he's based in in Illinois, actually. Oh, I think. really? And um, he does he he got really popular because he went and rewatched that show to catch a predator with Chris Hansen back in like the early two thousands. Okay. And just basically reacted and gave his commentary to okay. it. Okay. And so it's called the Predator Chronicles. And so he made like I think it was like 30 videos on that. Got pretty big that way. Well recently, <clears throat> over like the past two years, he's gone back and has done reviews of recent Steven Seagal films. He is so funny. I, I, he is so funny, and his reviews of these movies are are just so well done. And like, <laughs> it's 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 actually really interesting to see like what Steven Seagal has come down to, and like the the absolute crap he has done movie wise over mm. the past like five years of his career. Look, Mister Mister Gigi, M I S T A, Mister Gigi, Gigi Capital. I'll have to send you his channel, but his Steven Seagal film reviews are hysterical. Yes, and they're they're one of my favorite ways to spend like a half an hour when I just need like a cheap laugh. Yeah, he's he is like really funny, and he's very <laughs> much. Like, huh? Anybody watching? I gotta Mr. check Gigi. it out. Uh, yeah, Mister Gigi, if hilarious. you're watching, big fan, big fan, <laughs> <laughs> big fan. When he when he he's got like this pair of like Steven Seagal sunglasses that he wears during some of them and and it's 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 funny it's that's, really well done that's every excellent. merchant to give you their life saving <laughs> dominate a domesticated pig put a nuclear warhead in its mouth and turn it into a remote controlled suicide bomber split yourself into seven identical copies with identical powers and turn the screen into a living nightmare use ego projection project your hp so high it doesn't even render in the ui die anyway reverse the outcome oh with my cognition <laughs> One of the billion divergent timelines instead. Tap the mass mind. Pluck sentience from the universe. Reset your cooldowns and do it all over again. As you can probably tell, it was so damn powerful that the developers had to code in their own countermeasures. Now, the more powerful you are, the more others start to notice. Your psychic glibber increases and uh. other espers will come to take your mind for their own. The attacks uh. become so brutal, the burden of power so great, that you might even be tempted in your moment of weakness to eat a fuck ton of humble pies. Because in this game, the bakeries are owned by Nietzsche, and his pastries induce ego death. But the player will forever subvert the developer. Do you know how to end the pursuit to stop the hunt? To escape? You have to accept first that there is no escape and allow <laughs> yourself to be caught. And in the briefest of moments, you dominate your pursuer and kill yourself. Your old flesh is gone, but inside new flesh, your mind lives on. This game is truly exceptional, but it does have its problems. One, it's made on Unity. That's not immediately noticeable. But when a small cloud of gas accidentally falls down a pipe and has to generate 10 levels of dungeon for the sake of simulation, yeah, you're gonna notice. Two, sometimes an essential quest NPC contracts a fungal infection and is regrettably chopped to pieces. Sometimes the sandbox 
breaks and you lose your progress. The game oh, practically no. expects you to use console commands to fix itself, so don't feel too bad about it. Free. Most of the game is randomly generated, but you can tell immediately if a character is pre-written because the first Tumblr fursona you meet will give you an option to ask about her neon purple hair and quirky way of talking. I like the writing in this game, but come on, disliked by the water barons for her queer appearance? Really? Maybe she just looks like shit. Listen, I can respect the fact that you can self-insert your OC girlfriend, but at least give us the option of dismembering her. And four, I want more. There's not enough of this world, and you're spending too much of your time banning me off your Discord for making reasonable gameplay suggestions. Initially, I dismissed this game as overly simplistic. I come back now to tell you how deep it goes. Even with a time given, I've only told you a fraction of what I know. It should be noted that the writing in this game is fantastic. There's so much lore, like how the banana ranchers in this game are plants themselves. It's plants enslaving plants. It's plantation what? owners beating other plantation owners. They just work up the hierarchy. It's like my slave name used to be whipped cream. Now I'm whipping cream. The music in this game is very charming and sets the tone that you're in a completely alien environment where nearly every rock, tree, and flower is very much alive. It's a beautiful, wonderful, and janky mess of a game. And despite being in early access, it's already given me hours hundreds play. of hours of enjoyment. As such, yeah. I give it a completely random yet quantifiably high score, which can only be expressed on a graphical calculator. It's fantastic. It's not for everyone, and it's incredibly neurotic. But if that sounds like something you'd enjoy, give it a try. We negotiated a deal, however small, for about 10% off for the next couple of days on GOG. Follow the link, and you save a single dollar. As always, more content to come, so stay tuned. That content will consist of more than four pixels. A warm thanks to the many members of the Merchants Guild, generously funding and bankrolling these videos. Except this one is completely free because I can't make you pay money for abstract text adventures. You're all truly wonderful. Take care and have a good one. Hey, hey, people. Mm. Yo, that so, game yeah, just to be honest, it's insane. not... Um, it's the Caves not of Cock. No. Cock. Cock is... Is it, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh. This uh, to to be clear, uh, yeah. This I don't think it's a game that I would want to play. I think it's a lot not, a lot of the games that Seth gets into are those like steep learning curve games. Yeah, that it's like okay, you're gonna sink a lot of time into this before you start having fun and feel like you even know what's going on. Yes. It's it's <laughs> it's the type of game where it can literally only exist in a in a 2D game. In, yeah. In a in a two dimensional world that is, you know, text based. It, it can't be a 3D rendered game because there's just not enough memory and space to to do everything that there is in the game. Yeah. Um but there's something like interesting about like because you're not focusing on like creating this incredibly graphical wonder sure oh no like, right no no there's so much right. like nuance and so much exploration nuance. that can happen in a very different way right you can't like and i think seth does such a good job of pointing that out like at the end like hey this is not a game for everyone i mean clearly but it, it, for the people that do enjoy it, man, is it like just such a unique gem? Well, so and for you can clearly like sink so many hours into it. Oh yeah, oh my god, that it is valuable. Oh my god. Yeah, yeah, that is insane. Just yeah, mm -hmm. the amount of time sunk into that game, and even just to, you know, Seth's like, oh, I've just scratched the surface. Yeah, or just like, scratched the surface. It's a fraction of what you can do in this game, and yeah. it is insane. Yeah, I mean, even just looking at his gameplay totals, like, what did that say? Like, 80 hours that week? That was nuts. Yeah. That was nuts. I mean, dang. Like, it's just, it's just incredible that, like, now in today's day and age, like, you can create something that gets people's attention for an hour at a time, let alone tens and hundreds over the course of several weeks or months i mean it's yeah so kudos to the game developer not my type of game um but well that's what i love about seth because it's still interesting to learn about it and oh, to no, like yeah. see seth play it but to watch it and go like wow I don't think I would ever get through the, yeah. the learning curve. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I'm very yeah. impressed with it. And and 
but it still makes it look like fun. Yeah. And interesting and engaging. And just to know like the amount of craziness that, yeah. that goes on with it. But yeah. Man, always love a good Seth video. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, hit that like button, subscribe to uh, the channel if you haven't done so already. Leave a comment in that comment section down below. Yeah. Let check us know if the, you've played this game. Yeah, check, yeah. Let it do. Let us know. Um, and even even going back to our previous Seth videos, like let us know how this one rates to his other ones. You know, yeah. other games that he's played. You think he's played some other crazier ones? Or, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Do you think this one is? I don't know. This one's up there. Like, yeah, maybe no, this definitely one was Space Station definitely. 13. Yeah, yeah. Makes me think of that one. Um, let us know. And then also, you know, always check out the links in the description down below so you can check out everything else that we're doing uh, and what we're up to personally. So mm -hmm. check that out. We'll see you next time. Chicago Reacts.